Welcome back everyone to another Mythfall devlog. If you're new to the channel, I'm building a browser-based bullet hell MMO from scratch in Golang and documenting the process along the way. This week I wanted to upgrade the Mythfall engine a bit by adding hot code reloading. The main pain point I had was that every time I wanted to update a specific UI menu, I had to recompile and rebuild my game, run over to wherever the UI interaction point was, interact with it, and then figure out if my change worked. So I really wanted to improve the turnaround time on testing these sorts of things. But I also think this improvement will greatly improve the speed that I can add content in more than just the UI system. One thing that I will say about adding this uh, hot reloader uh, is that it was definitely worth it. I guess it does two things. On one hand, it saves me a ton of time because I don't have to keep constantly rerunning my binary and uh, checking to see if my code change uh, did what I wanted it to do. Uh, and on the other hand, I think it lets me build better things because I get less exhausted waiting for my builds to finish. Like in five seconds after I change a piece of code and save the file, uh, the code changes reflected inside the game. So it's really easy to see visual updates. So I'm hoping to use this and leverage it to uh, help make Mythfall look a little, a lot better. Uh, because like if you look at like typical game engines like Unity, they have like kind of what you see is what you get editors where you can just drag and drop stuff in. And I haven't really had that. So it's been a little bit hard to uh, debug and improve like the visual part of the game so having this in place will save me a ton of time i think and um will also let me like make higher quality visual decisions because i can uh, just like flip through more uh, visual options by like changing colors around like moving things around and stuff like that so this is a super nice improvement to have i think and uh, it's well worth it if you're building your own engine and you're deciding if you want to add something like this uh, i highly recommend it i uh, very much wish that i added it sooner on all right so the first thing that i did was basically go online and try to see if anyone's done anything like this before uh I did stumble across a lot of people recommending this uh, application called Air. This is more of a hot, or not a hot code reloader. It's more of a um, automatic rebuilder tool. So it basically, what is used for the primary use cases for people who want to rebuild their uh, server, they can just constantly have this running. It'll detect if any files change and then it ends up uh, rebuilding the server and relaunching it. Uh, so it's pretty useful if you're looking for that, but I needed something that more uh, won't uh, tear down the main binary, but could rather uh, reload code inside of the main binary without having to stop and restart it. So I did find this. Uh, I think it's pronounced Yagi, but uh, this is a package that is a Go interpreter. Uh, it actually seems pretty nice, but there are a few things that uh, prevented me from using it, um, but I did look into it a little bit. Uh, there's another one I found called, uh, it's a HashCorp uh, Go plugin. This one seems to work by sending messages over RPC to uh, some kind of plugin server. Uh, they would also be running concurrently with your main uh, binary. So that might have some use cases, but this doesn't work for me either. And I'll talk about why in a little bit. Uh, the uh, final way that I found was uh, the Go in the Go standard library, there's a package called plugin and you can use it. It basically uh, executes a DL open uh, on the Linux side and can be used to uh, kind of load dynamic libraries libraries that way. So I ended up going with this. There's a, there's a few problems with this approach uh, that we'll go into uh, into more detail on. Uh, but overall, this actually worked pretty well uh, for me. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But yeah, let's look at some Let's look at some diagrams. So this is how I understand that each of these uh, plugin libraries work. Uh, Yagi seems like I would have a main game binary that would call the Yagi package. You would basically read the dynamic code, which would then be interpreted, and then I could like store it as a function pointer someplace and then call it whenever I needed to. Uh, the trouble with this, or there's two troubles, I guess. Uh, one trouble with this is that it doesn't support generics, which I use a lot in my code just because it's nice to have generic things. Uh, Yagi doesn't support that yet, so that was one problem. Uh, the other main problem is Whenever you need to interact with an external library, like for example, I have a rendering library that uses under the hood OpenGL. Whenever I need to interact with that, I have to generate some bindings for that external library. Those look like this. So it's basically a big like symbol table that holds all of the different things that could be referenced uh, by that uh, library. Um, so you have, to, you have to generate and maintain these. So it's a little bit fragile because of that. Every time I change this library, now I need to go and regenerate this binding, uh, which is a little bit troublesome and a little bit annoying to do. So there's a few things like that that are annoying. Also, interpreted code isn't the fastest, so that's another potential problem uh, that you could have with doing something like this. And I would also have to generate this binding for literally every single package. So this was just a few of the external packages that I reference. Then if we look at the HashCorp plugin package, uh, how I understand it working is that the main game binary would import that package. Then there would be dynamic code.
code that runs in a separate server uh, that hosts an RPC endpoint. So then the HashiCorp Go plugin would, would call that by sending over the data to that uh, plugin server. And then the result of that execution would be sent back. Uh, this is all well and good for a lot of things. Uh, I think for my case though, because I would have to send a, an, an enormous amount of data over, like for example, if I wanted to hot plug some sort of physics system, now I have to send over every single like position, velocity, acceleration of everything just so that I can execute like the next position uh, in that system. So that's a little bit annoying because of that. The other main problem is that if I wanted to reference an external rendering library, like my rendering library that I have, uh, that's now in a separate process. So I can't access the window that's generated by this game binary because it's in a different process space. So I have no way of like having rendering code execute here unless I like piped back instructions here and then had the rendering code execute on this side. That's just more trouble than it's worth probably. So I ended up giving up on that idea. Uh, the Go plugin design, this is how it would look. Or this is the high level of how it would look. But I basically would have a main game binary. The main game binary would load uh, or would reference the plugin package, which is in the Go standard library. Uh, then I would have my dynamic code, which would get compiled to a SO library, which is a, dyna a dynamic library. And then the plugin package would load that uh, dynamically, look up the symbol that I wanted to reference, and then I could just call that directly. Uh, so then the nice part there is that if I want to call an external library, I can just call that because this external library technically would be referenced inside of the game binary because it's already uh, imported statically there. There are a few problems with it. Like for example, the plugins are, the plugin library is only supported by Linux, FreeBSD, and Mac OS. So this isn't something I could use for like uh, supporting mods or anything like that. For a game engine like development tool type thing, it works pretty well, especially because I just use Linux. The other downside is that uh, whenever I build and import a plugin, I can't unload the plugin. So let, let's say I rebuild the plugin 10 times. I'll just have nine old plugins like lingering around inside of my process, which I ended up not being that big of a deal. I thought I would be more of a pain, but it ended up being fine. And the final problem with them is that the build for the main game binary and the plugin have to be identical, which is a little bit hard to maintain. So if I ever change something here and then rebuild the plugin, then uh, that'll cause the plugin to think it's referencing a different version of this external library, which will cause it to fail to import to the main game binary. So yeah, basically, whenever you have a plugin dynamically loading, the only thing I can change is the code inside of here. If I change anything external to this, it'll just fail to, to uh, reload into the game binary. So that's another little annoying part. So I'll talk about how I got around uh, all of these problems, I guess. So basically, I have two main packages, one for my development build and one for my production build. I actually already had these, but I ended up reusing it for uh, this use case as well. Uh, so let's go through the prod case because it's a little bit simpler. Uh, so prod will import the, or will call down to the main game package, which is kind of like all of my major like client code, I guess. Uh, then prod will also import the plugin package and kind of inject it into the main game package. And then both of these can reference, both of these packages can reference the external rendering library uh, and use that. So kind of this is all that's needed uh, for the production use case to work and everything's statically referenced, everything's as usual. There's one little weird case where I have to uh, read the plugin a plugin function here and then import it into the uh, main client package. So that's what I meant when I said uh, I'll read in the plugin package and then import it, kind of inject it into the main game package. So that's how that would work for the prod case. Uh, for the dev case, it's a lot more complicated. Basically, I have to take the plugin package, copy it to a different package location. And how you do that is you basically make a new directory with some random name. I did uh, temp and then I made a random number generator that generated a random end on that directory name. And then I put the plugin files in there. So now the package is referenced like that. I ended up uh, using air, that package uh, rebuilder that I mentioned earlier on. I ended up using air to rebuild the plugin constantly. So air will constantly rebuild the plugin every time one of the files inside of it changes. And it builds it to a plugin.so file, which is my dy dynamic library. And then inside of my dev build, I have a special system which reads the plugin.so file, ch checks to see if it changed at all. And if it has changed, it dynamically reloads it and then dynamically re-injects the plugin function into uh, the main game package so that it can be used later on. So this is how that system looks. It's basically a global function pointer here, get plugin render systems, which is all of the extra systems I'm adding from the plugin. And then I have a system that runs inside of the physics update loop, uh, which basically goes and uh, checks to make sure we're a dev build. And if we are, then it hot reloads this plugin from this uh, destiny or this library location, I guess, and uh, checks to see if it updated. If it 
is updated, it needs to be reloaded, then it relooks up that get render systems uh, function pointer and then injects it into the uh, scheduler like this. And this is the main scheduler that runs for the game. So then the next physics tick and render tick that runs, these functions will get used rather than the other ones. So that's kind of how it works at a very, very high level. Uh, so the first thing that I did was uh, I tried to do a few different experiments just in a small example project. So I made a new example project. I tried a few examples, or I tried a few tests with uh, using Yagi, but I ended up running into those problems that I mentioned before. So I kind of quickly gave up with that. And then I tried a few attempts at the Go plugin uh, solution. I would build some uh, dynamic library, reload it, and then finally kind of landed on something that I like, uh, which is kind of what I'm using right now. Uh, but basically how it works is uh, I have this main application that runs and looks like this. It just uh, I'll just be able to change the background color here of the window. Um, but I can go in here. You can see this was the uh, old build where I basically just copy this file over uh, to this temporary directory package and then I rebuild that into a separate uh, file which is here and that's my SO file. Um, but basically I can uh, change the color to be more red. Get this window open. And then I can uh, do this, rebuild it. And you see that it changes the color. And I can do that for basically any color I want. Because um, it just re it's rebuilding the plugin, uh, which changes this line here. Um, but I can change any code inside of here and it'll all just work. So that was just kind of my little demo test that I wrote. Uh, just to experiment with this strategy. And it ended up working out pretty well. So I uh, kind of adopted it for my main Mythfall project. Uh, one other decision point that I kind of had to uh, think through was uh, deciding whether or not I wanted to split up my plugin into several smaller plugins and hot reload them separately. Uh, so I kind of had maybe one idea where I could do something like this. Right, have like plugin one that loads itself, plugin two that loads plugin two, plugin three that loads plugin three. Then the main game binary would load in, uh, what, however, it, or whichever one changed would just load in the one that changes. Um, and then all of these would exist in the process space and would all be accessible. The one thing I didn't like about this strategy was that if I if I ever did end up with a dependency where like plugin one depended on plugin two, I figured it would be very very complicated to manage that. So I decided to just go with this a kind of single plugin solution where there's only one plugin package here. And um, I think I'm pretty happy with this because most of the time there's just like a few systems I'm gonna throw into the plugin package, things I change a lot, like for rendering and stuff like that, uh, rather than having this like kind of complicated and convoluted uh, plugin interaction thing that might be weird to think about. Um, I don't think this is super unviable, but uh, I just don't think it's worth the pain of setting up all of these different plugins. So it's so kind of opted towards uh, just having one big plugin rather than a bunch of small plugins, I guess. I also figured that if I did need to break it off into another smaller or another, uh, like split this into two, this would be a better starting point to just have one that separates the two rather than having two that need to be combined into one. I figured this would be an easier uh, path forward. Uh, one package that I found kind of late in tour into my uh, development of my own little hot swapping uh, tool was I found this other one, this other guy had made a hot swapping tool um, called hot swap, but it seems to do a lot of the same stuff as me, except it kind of forces you into uh, one specific interface that looks like this for your plugin. It also seems to support having uh, several smaller plugins and also has like, uh, it seems like it has a nice order of execution for when you reload a plugin, if you have some like on load things or on init things that need to be executed, uh, this can do that too. I didn't use this. I didn't look into the code very much to see how good it is, but this seems to be like more of a standardized way of doing what I'm doing. Um, but I think I will just stick with what I've already built because uh, it does seem to work and it seems to work just fine. Um, I'd rather just use that rather than have to um, import somebody else's project that I might that might confuse me uh, for what I'm trying to do. So, but yeah, you might look into this if you're trying to do the same sort of thing uh, because this seems to already do this. Anyways, that's all I have for this week. As always, an absolutely massive thank you to all the supporters on YouTube, Twitch, GitHub, and Patreon. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.